and good afternoon, everybody. Feels weird to see uh, say afternoon there and not morning, but it is afternoon and good afternoon it is. It is truly such a, a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, my name is Caleb Gagne. I am technically the pastoral intern at West Village Church, uh, but most of my job is related to associate pastoral roles. I help with uh, pastoral care, I help with the preaching, and I help with the newcomers and making them feel welcomed. Um, but we, our church is in Westboro, but I actually live right here in this neighborhood. I live two minutes, maybe a five-minute walk that way. Um, so it's really cool to be able to be connected in my community in this way for uh, the first time, and it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, and I just want to thank you guys so much for inviting me in and uh, having me here and talk with you guys. And um, Pastor David asked me to come and preach on his birthday. Happy birthday. Um, and he asked if I would continue on in his, your series uh, through Romans. And so I'm really excited about the passage he gave me. When I opened up the passage that Pastor David asked me to preach on, uh, I showed it to my wife, and she's like, that's what he wants you to preach on? And he must really want to see what you're made of. He wants to know what you got in there. So uh, we're going to be looking at Romans 5, 12 to 21. It is, it is such a beautiful passage of Scripture. It's beautiful words. It is, it's jam-packed with theology. Uh, it is... Uh, it's very heavy, uh, and it's, it's actually quite debated among scholars and, and whatnot, but we're not going to get into a ton of that stuff. We're going to focus on the beauty of this passage and the good news that it shows us. Um, so Romans 5, uh, verses 12 all the way to 21. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to dive on into God's Word together. Let me pray. God, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for the space that you've provided for, uh, for Southeast City to, to, to meet here regularly and uh, come together and um, fellowship and learn and grow together, Lord. And that I thank you for the light that they are in this community. I thank you for the work that they're doing here um, in this community, Lord, and in Ottawa. And I thank you for the gospel that's being spread here, Lord. I pray for us today, Lord. I pray that you would speak boldly to us. I pray that you would use the Holy Spirit. You would um, illumine your word to us today, Lord, and that you would soften our hearts and soften our minds to understand your good news today, Lord. And I pray that we wouldn't just uh, hear your truth, Lord, but we, we would listen to it. We would let it sink deep into our hearts, and we would um, go over it, Lord, and we would just wrestle with it, and we would come... Uh, through today, loving you more. Uh, Lord, I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, Romans 5, 12 to 21. If you have your Bibles, I would ask you to follow along with me. Starting in verse 12, it says, Therefore, just as sin came in th the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more will have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase in the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through life, through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 
If you are taking notes today, our first point is, number one, death comes through Adam for all. Something that I personally love to do in life and in ministry is discipleship. I love walking alongside people, and I love uh, kind of wrestling through the, the, the tough and hard questions with them. I love going through the hard stuff and dealing with the day-to-day sort of things of life, the doubts and the questions and the wonders. In doing this, in you know, going through the hard stuff and walking alongside people, something that I've come across is there's generally one big question that everyone comes to in their life at one point or another. And most people, if not everybody, will wonder at some point in their life, am I a good person? I don't know if you've wondered that, but I have wondered that before. Am I a good person? Have I benefited this world more than I've hindered it? Maybe you're sitting there thinking something like, you know, I I do a lot of volunteer work. I help people every chance I get. I put money in the tithing plate every time it comes by. So, yeah, I think maybe I am a good person. Maybe you're sitting there and you're wondering that... What does it even mean to be a good person? Or maybe you just, you just don't know where you're at. Either way, this passage that we're looking at today lays it out very clearly for all of us. As Paul is writing to the church in Rome, he says, he says, let me rewind for a second here. Let me go back and take you back to the beginning of the story. And Paul, he brings the church of Rome all the way back to Adam and Eve. He says, Remember that story that you learned about the the creation of man, the beginning of mankind? Remember learning about Adam and Eve and where it all started? Remember learning about how Eve took the fruit that was the forbidden tree and how she took and ate of it and how Adam did nothing to teach her and to lead her and to stop her and he failed? He says that's where it starts. That's where sin entered the world. You see, it was Adam who was told not to eat of the fruit. It was Adam's job to teach Eve, to protect her, to lead her. And Adam failed. Eve took the fruit of the forbidden tree and she ate of it. And she gave it to Adam and he ate of it. And in that very moment, sin entered the world. What happened when Adam failed was he left us an inheritance. I'm sure that many of you, if not all of you, know what inheritance is. We all, I'm sure, dream of one day finding out that we had a a long-lost uncle or aunt that made millions of dollars and then suddenly passed away and left us a million dollars and then suddenly all of our life's problems are, you know, washed away and life is good. I'm joking. Sort of. A little bit. I might have wanted a few times. <laughs> Inheritance, it's your birthright. It's what's left for you by the generation prior. And when Adam sinned, he left us, all of us, all of humanity, an inheritance. He left us an inheritance of sin and of death. So now when we're born, we are born into a world of sin. We are born into this inheritance of sin. And as we know, sin leads to death. As I'm sure you'll see in a few weeks as you continue on in your uh, series in Romans, Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. And this sin that leads to death, this is our birthright. Now, maybe you're thinking something, Oh, hey, that's not fair. Just because someone did something thousands of years ago, now I have to pay the consequences for that? Yeah, you do. See, when a parent dies and they have debt, what happens is that their kids inherit that debt. And when Adam and Eve took what wasn't theirs to take, they left us the debt to take. Now, Maybe you've gotten to it. Maybe you're like, okay, fine. We're born into sin. Sin leads to death. Fine, that's okay. But what if I don't sin? What if I go my life without sinning? Then, then do I have to inherit the, the sin and the death as well? And you're right. That would be, that'd be nice. 
And it comes back, though, to the question, am I a good person? Right? A good person wouldn't sin. And if I didn't sin, if I was a good person, then I wouldn't need to pay the debt that Adam left for us. It would be nice. But it's not how it works. As we see here in verse 12, and as I'm sure you saw in Romans 3, all have sinned. Every single one of us has sinned. In fact, we sin every single day. I sin every single day. And if every single one of us has sinned and does sin, that means every single one of us deserves death. So to answer the question, maybe bluntly, maybe harshly, no, you're not a good person. No matter how much good you think you've done, you have fallen short of the glory of God. You are a sinner. You are not a good person. So Pastor David invites me to come teach, and all I do is tell you that you're terrible people, that you're sinners, and that you're not good people. Whose idea was it to bring me here anyways, right? Have grace, please. Because I'm not a good person either. I'm not. But stick with me here, because we're going to see the hope that is offered in this. So don't give up on me just yet. Okay, so we get it now. We're not good people. We are all born into sin, which means all of us are sinners, and the wages of sin is death, so we all deserve to die. We get that. So what do we do with this? Where do we go from here? Verse 14 it says, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who is a type of the one who was to come. Death, it keeps reigning. Everyone, including Moses, was born into the inheritance of sin and death that Adam left for us. But did you catch the ending of verse 14? The ending of verse 14 says, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. So Adam, we see, is a type of the one who was to come. What does that mean? Well, let's keep reading and find out. Look back with me at verses 15 and 19, if you have your Bibles open. Verse 15, it says, But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many die through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of of God in the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in the life of that one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. So our second point today, if you're following along, is number two, we are offered a free gift in Jesus. It says, but the free gift is not like the trespass. In verses 12 to 14, as we just saw, Paul hammers this idea into us that we are not good people. He makes it abundantly clear that we have missed the mark, that we have sinned, that we deserve death. And you leave verse 14 feeling discouraged and beat up. Thankfully, though, Paul didn't leave it there. And neither did Jesus. Paul, as he's writing in his his letter to Rome, he introduces this idea of a free gift. As we read the passage here, the words free gift feel like they're almost jumping off the page at you, and they're, they're supposed to do that. 
Paul mentions the words free gift five times in just three verses. It's a free gift, free gift, free gift. So something that is very important to know when you're studying the Bible is that repetition equals emphasis. Okay, everyone say it with me. Repetition equals emphasis. Great. Okay. So as Paul was writing his letter to Rome, he didn't exactly have a highlighter that he could pick up and circle the things that were important to him. And as he's writing his letter, he didn't exactly have the the pleasure to write in italics like we see when we're reading books and the author wants us to take note of something. So we had to find a way to make things stand out, things stick in the reader's minds. And so what he did, as was the custom in the writing at that time, was he used repetition. Repetition equals emphasis. He wanted his readers to understand the importance of this free gift. So what is this ever so important free gift? We find the answer right here at the end of verse 17. The free gift is righteousness. Now, to be righteous, you need to be justified. And the problem is that we can't justify ourselves because of this inheritance left for us by Adam. Which is why Christ came to die. So if we're going to understand the, on the work that Christ did on the cross, we need to understand justification and what that means and why we need to be righteous. So to get a little, I'll say, nerdy on you, justification is a legal declaration. And in our case, it's a legal declaration that is made by God and God alone. It is what is known as your legal standing. So in, in the court systems of America and Canada, there is what is called your standing. And your standing determines if there is a case to be made against you or not. So... If you have a, you can have a wrong standing, which means that there, there is a case to be made against you. There's guilt to be found. There's more to be un- uncovered. Or you can have a right standing, which means that you're good. There's no guilt to be found. And when we are born into this inheritance that Adam left us, we're found in a wrong standing. And we don't have what it takes to bring ourselves into the right standing with God. So what does all this legal talk have to do with you? Remember, justification is a legal declaration made by God in regard to your standing. We cannot be found righteous if we are in a wrong standing. So what God did was he sent his son to die on the cross for you, to take your punishment, to take the wrath of God that was meant for you. And he put you in a right standing with God. So I want everyone to follow me here. I want you all to close your eyes for a minute and picture this with me. Go ahead, close your eyes and picture this. Picture yourself, you're sitting in a courtroom. Probably not much different than the room that you're in today. If you don't know what it looks like, picture the B movie. Okay, that's what I do. In this courtroom, you are the defendant. You are the accused. You are on trial, and if found guilty, you will be punished with the death penalty. The crimes that you committed were so heinous, so terrible, that if found guilty, you will die. Picture yourself sitting there, listening to your lawyer do his best to set you free, but it's not looking good. The jury, they don't look like they believe you. Now, you know that you did it. You know for a fact that you're guilty. But you never thought that it would come to this. You never thought that you would have to actually pay up for those heinous crimes. The jury makes up their minds. The judge calls you to stand to pronounce your sentence. The judge delivers the worst news you have ever heard. She says, having been found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, the crimes that you committed, I pronounce you guilty and sentence you to death. You can't be surprised, but you are hoping that it wouldn't come to this. 
Now, just as the judge is about to slam her gavel down to make things official, someone bursts in the back and opens the doors. Someone rushes in and everyone turns back to see what's going on. And a man screams, I will take the punishment for this person. I will take their sentencing. I will take their death. And the next thing you know, this person, the cops are the cuffs on, that, on him. And he's taken out and he serves your death penalty and you walk out free. You can open your eyes. This is what Christ did on the cross for you and for me. Because of Adam, we are all guilty and we deserve death. We deserve hell and eternal separation from God. That's what we deserve. That's what would be right. But instead, Christ died on the cross taking our place. He paid our penalty. He bared the the wrath of God that was meant for us. No, because of his death and resurrection, if we repent of our sins and trust in Jesus, we are brought into a right standing with God and can have a true, real, genuine relationship with him. He took the inheritance that was left for us by Adam, he took it for himself, and he gave us a new inheritance, a new covenant, an inheritance of life of eternal life. Look how Paul contrasts the inheritance that Adam left for us with the new one that Christ gives us. I think Paul sums it up really well in verses 18 and 19. He says, verse 18, he says, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Adam left us with sin and death, but Christ swapped our inheritance and he left us with righteousness that comes through justification because of his work on the cross. That is the free gift. That is the good news. That is the hope that we have in Jesus. So the next question that we need to ask now is what do we do with this free gift? Keep reading with me and let's find out. Look at verses 20 and 21. It says, Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that... As sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So our third point today is number three, through Christ we can live in righteousness. See, it's, it's one thing to receive a gift, but it's another thing to actually know what to do with that gift. You can be given something amazing, you could be given a new car, but if Not knowing how to drive, it's a really heavy paperweight. Really pretty thing in your front yard. So what do we do with this gift? We see that Christ gives us the free gift of righteousness that comes through justification. That we're made right before God because of Jesus. So what do we do with that? Well, Paul actually thankfully makes it very clear for us that once we receive this free gift, we now have to live in it. We have to live in righteousness. In the last two verses here, Paul gives us some instructions on what it looks like and how to live in righteousness. And in these instructions, Paul, I say, kind of left us two coins. He gives us two warnings and two uh, encouragements. Each one of these coins has on the one side a warning and the other side an encouragement. But each one is dealing with the same sort of issue, the same um, idea. So you flip the coin, you get, you know, encouragement and warning. Each issue to the same coin. The first issue, or the first coin, is the law. That's one thing that 
Paul gives a warning and an encouragement about. And the second issue or the second coin is this idea of grace. So these are the two things that we're going to look at. We're going to look at the warnings first and get that through, and then I'll give you the good news, okay? I'll give you the hope. So the first warning is that salvation cannot be gained through obedience to the law. Paul sort of hints at this, and he brings it up through these nine or so verses, and he comes back at the end of it to really hammer it into the reader. He wants us to understand what's going on here. Salvation cannot be gained through obedience to the law. Let me simplify that even a little bit further for you. No one can earn salvation. Humanity has proved it over and over that we are not capable of following the law. Think about it for a second. Do you think that you are capable of following, obeying the Ten Commandments your entire life? If you're thinking, maybe that's possible, maybe I could give that a shot. Let me remind you that there's over, actually over 600 commandments given in just the first five books of the Bible. Now you're not doing with 10, you're doing with over 600 that you can't break once in your entire life. Do you still think you can do it? How about this? Take Adam. Adam didn't have these 600 commandments to deal with. Adam didn't even have the 10 Adam was told, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What happened? He failed. Mankind has proven again and again that we are not capable of earning salvation, even though we try. We try again and again. The Israelites tried They tried again and again, and they failed, and they failed. The Pharisees tried. I try, and I'm sure that you have tried as well. So Paul gives us this warning. He says, don't try. Salvation cannot be gained through obedience to the law. And the second warning is this. Grace should not promote sin. Paul says, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And in context, we understand what that means. But if I read just that to you, where you took that one little part of the verse out of context, you might think something like, oh man, this is great. One part sin equals two parts grace. That is great math. That means I can do whatever I want. I can just keep on going and sin and I can do as I please. And the more I sin and the more hurt I do, the more grace I'll receive. This is great. It's not how it works. And if that's what you're thinking or you're ever tempted to think that, look at the context. Paul goes and gives us verse 21. He says, whoa there, hold on now. That's not what I meant. Gives us verse 21. says, so that as sin reigned in death, Grace also might reign through righteousness. Paul pleads with you to remember that sin only leads to death. All that sin gets you is death. Paul continues this idea on, as you'll see in Romans 6, I'm sure, and explains it in much more depth. But in Romans 6, 23, he says, For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So please do not think that you should keep sinning because grace abounds all the more. Rather, choose to live in righteousness. Now, here comes the good part. Let's turn those coins over and look at the encouragements here. The first encouragement or is that we are not bound by the law. Remember, Paul warns us that salvation cannot be gained through obedience to the law. So we flip that coin over and we see that we are not bound to the law. We see the hope and the freedom. Because if we're bound by the law, one, we would need a way to salvation still. Probably today there'd be something sort of sacrificial. A sad goat would be involved. But even more than that, maybe, we would be constantly reminded 
of our guilt and our shame. And we'd have to wear that and carry that. And Jesus says in Matthew 5, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So you might be thinking maybe, well, then what's the point of the law? Do we even need the law? Let's just throw out the Old Testament. Yes, the law is needed. We still need the law. In fact, the law is essential. The law shows us our need for grace. It shows us our need for Christ. Because Jesus took the weight of the law onto himself. He knew that we were not capable of upholding the law and living to that standard. So he took the weight of it. He took the burden of it. And he put it on himself and he left it on the cross. Christ took our punishment. He took our guilt and our shame. He took our death penalty. He took our sins and he left them on the cross. He left them buried in the tomb. They're dead. They're gone. He came and he fulfilled the law. He gave us a new covenant. He made a way to salvation. He earned salvation on our behalf and freely offers it to us today. So now there's no guilt. There's no shame. He removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. It's gone. The second encouragement is this. Paul says that grace will reign. And that's a promise. Verse 21 says, So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Because of Adam, sin and death reigned through everyone in the world and born into this inheritance. But now because of Christ, because Christ conquered death, Because Christ conquered sin, he conquered the grave, grace will reign. So what does that mean for us? What is our part in this? Our part is simply eternal life. Jesus paid the price for our sins. He served our death penalty. He made us right with God and know though now those who believe in him, who repent of their sins and put their trust in Jesus are offered this hope of eternal life. This promise of eternal life. I want you to just actually sit there and think about this for a second. We can, we can hear eternal life and we can be told about it and talk about it, but sometimes it just brushes over us like, like second nature. Think about it for a second. Eternal life with Jesus. This is not just a weightless, hollow promise to get you to turn over. This isn't like your phone company telling you that, you know, your phone plan is only $40 a month, and then you sign up, and the first two months are $40, and then the third one is $80, and you understood it was a hollow promise. It was fake. This is not a hollow promise. This is real, true, genuine hope. It is a promise that you will not perish but have eternal life. Eternal life worshiping our Heavenly Father. Just picture it for a moment. God sent His one and His only Son, Jesus, to live a perfect and blameless life. Jesus died on the cross and he was buried for three days, but he did not stay dead because the Father raised him from the dead. Now those, us, we who believe, we believe who he is, who he says he is, are offered the promise of eternal life. There's no more suffering. No more pain, no more tears. No more turning on the news to see the devastating state that our world is in. No more war. No more heartbreak. No more mourning. Just eternal life. Worshipping our Heavenly Father with perfect joy and perfect peace. This is what we're offered. 
So today, as we wrap things up here, Pastor David is going to come up and lead us in communion in just a moment here. But I want to ask you this question before I go. Where are you at today? Where do you find yourself today? Are you still stuck in the sin and death that Adam left us with? Or have you accepted the free gift of salvation? Are you still stuck in the trying to earn your way into salvation and trying to prove that you're good enough for it? Or are you accepting the gift of eternal life and living in righteousness? I want you to know that no matter where you find yourself today, you have the opportunity to move from there. If you are stuck in the sin and death left for us by Adam, I invite you to move today into grace. I invite you to accept the grace that Jesus so freely gives that's available for you today. You don't have to wait. You don't have to put it off. You can accept that free gift today. And if you're still trying to earn your salvation or trying to prove that you have what it takes, I invite you to move into living in righteousness. I invite you to surrender and I invite you to lay it all at the foot of the cross. So I ask, just take a moment and think about these things. Where are you at today? Where do you want to be? And where is God calling you to be? Just think about it for a second. I'm going to give you some time, then I'm going to come back up and pray. And then Pastor David will leave us, lead us in communion. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you have taken my sin, that you've taken my shame, that you've taken my guilt, that you've bared my burdens and you left them on the cross. Thank you that it is not up to me to earn my way to salvation because, Jesus, you know that I can't do that. So thank you. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for providing a way to salvation. Jesus, I pray today that as we sit here and as we go into communion, Lord, that if there's anyone here that is fighting to hear you or is wrestling with this truth, Lord, that that you would soften their hearts and that they would surrender to your goodness today, Lord. That we would be singing hallelujah and we would be rejoicing with the angels, the new brother or sister in Christ. I thank you again, Lord, for this church and the work that they're doing and the ways that you're working in them and through them, Lord. I pray that you would carry them forward. And Lord, I thank you for your son, Jesus, and the work that he did on the cross. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.